Hello and welcome to 25 Concepts in Anthropology. My name is Nicholas Herriman and I'm the author of The Entangled State. Today the concept we're going to look at is life cycle. So I want to ask you a question. How and when does adulthood occur? In different societies and in different social contexts, adulthood is associated with new responsibilities and rights. And to give you some example of the different contexts in which adulthood can occur, We've got one picture here of a bar mitzvah. This is when a Jewish boy becomes a man in the eyes of the community. From this day, John, he can actually go up to the front of the synagogue, the um, bima, or the dais, if you like, and he can recite uh, the Torah, the uh, Jewish Bible, out loud. Uh, so f in Jewish s communities, this occurs when you're about 13 or 14, 14. So for religious purposes, you become a man when you're about 13 or 14. Um, in Australia, where I live, uh, it's associated with your 21st party. Um, adulthood occurs around when you turn 21. Um, my dad was actually given the key to the house, uh, which meant that now he could come home whatever time he wanted. In Australia now, it tends to be a symbolic key is given or a card with a key drawn on it is given, just to imply that you've entered a new stage of life with new rights to come home whatever time you want, but also responsibilities. Um, in parts of America, in some American states, uh, this is associated with the ability to drink alcohol. When you're 21, it's le you have a right to drink alcohol. And the responsibilities also go along with adulthood, such as in contemporary Australia and America, things like voting and perhaps armed service. The next photo over here is of a sunatan. This is uh, done on pre-adolescent boys in Java. I've blotted it out so you can't see the detail, but here is the father, I presume, holding down his son and a man from the health department circumcising the boy. From this point on, this boy will be um, will be able to take part in activities in the mosque. And finally, from Central America, a quinceanera, which is a 15th uh, party, which, m which announces to the world the arrival of this girl as a woman. She is now marriageable. So, depending on the culture, there are different kinds of age stages and different ways of reaching them. And we can see this in relation to Australia with the idea of teenage. Um, in Australia and America, the whole idea of teenage really takes off after World War II, where there's a new group in society which is economically uh, empowered. They're getting part-time jobs and they have a lot of expendable income. And my mum was working in a uh, chemist back in the 50s, and well in the 60s anyway, and she remembers when a new range of makeup was made available for uh, young girls, uh, teenage girls I should say. So the idea was, um, you know, maybe it was invented by marketers, but it's something we have now adopted and teenage is now a stage of life where it wasn't a recognisable stage of life in, for example, the 19th century in the US or in Australia. Um, so by definition, life cycle, or alternatively known as life course, is the process of change and development of a person uh, in a culture, or sets of stages a person goes through from birth to death. And basically these are different in different cultures and different times. Um, so these stages of life often vary between men and women. Um, for example, in Java, you become a man through doing a sunatan, you become a woman through getting married. And I imagine Latin America, you can't become a woman through your quinceanera, but I'm not sure about how you become a man there. Sometimes these stages are marked by rituals, such as a 21st party. Sometimes they're actually um, marked by rites of passage, a special kind of ritual where you're taken away um, and you're treated rather, rather badly so that you make a progression to a new stage of life. In other cases, these become quite these are attained quite gradually. So I'm going through the perp through the stages of becoming a middle-aged man now, and this is becoming I mean, quite gradually. There's no middle-aged party for me. There was a party when I became a teenager, when I turned 18 and 21, but no middle-aged party, unfortunately. If you want to send presents, though, please feel free. Something like um, something that will make my hair darker, possibly, or some other midlife crisis present, like a Ferrari. Please do send. Um, so. Let's look at their application in two African contexts. First, I want to look at the uh, 
it's something like how you pronounce this word. Ong. I'm just going to look at young males. Ong are hunter gatherers from the Kalahari Desert in the south of Ameri in the south of Africa. Now, um, I'm just going to look at the first stages of life here, the, what you could call youth. And youth itself is another topic to study in anthropology, and I might talk about that in another presentation. Basically, the first years of life for uh, men and women are characterised by intense contact with the mother. The father's not that as, as involved as the mother, and typically um, nursing on demand. What that means is when the baby wants the breast, they get it. Um, following these initial years, um, as, as the child grows up to be a toddler, there's a lot of si sibling rivalry um, and also so brothers and sisters are bickering and fighting a lot and weaning occurs, often at the child's own instigation. It's typical amongst hunter-gatherer societies that um, you stay on the breast for much longer. This helps reduce fertility in contexts which don't s um, support large populations. Young boys then move on to playing with toy bows and arrows and these are, through this they develop skills which when they get to around about 12 years they can apply as they accompany their fathers on hunts. Now initially there's not much pressure, I mean in her book on the Ngong, Shostak describes a situation where a boy laughingly describes when he saw some big game he climbed up a tree because uh, he was so scared and he wasn't teased or anything for that so this is different to for example in Australia where if a child of that age shows fear they're teased. Um, when the boy is about 15 to 18 years old they, he will have his first big kill after that he'll get um, ritual tattoos and will be eligible for marriage. So that's um, youth, um, particularly um, uh, males. Now let's look at the Koronko. The Koronko come from the north of Africa um, around the border of South and North Sudan, a mountain called, or mountain range by the look of it, called Nuba. And this is where you can find the Koronko. And the Koronko are famous as um, wrestlers. Uh, you can see here some images of uh, Koronko wrestlers in black and white, I think from about the 1940s or 50s, as I'm checking my notes. So you can see on, on one side we've got the Koronko the Koronko uh, age characters up to 12 to 13 years old uh, you're in the blood age class and you have no activities then from 13 to 16 you go to light wrestling 17 to 20 years old you become severe wrestling 21 to 25 you get into severe wrestling and, and spear fighting then from 26 to 50 you're in spear fighting and then after 50 you have no activities so they've got a uh, few life stages, if you like. Amongst the Mesakin, it's limited. There's a uh, pre-puberty -pu -pu stage, then there's a, a light wrestling stage from about the ages of 17 to 26, um, which develops into spear fighting and so on. And then after that, there's no activities. So um, for the Koronko there are, who are pictured here, there are many stages. For the Mesakin, who come from nearby, there are only a few stages. Now what that means is that there are rather abrupt transitions for the Mesokin and this makes it very stressful particularly for Mesokin males who value their virility um, when their sister's children, particularly their sister's son, come and demand their inheritance. So if you remember from the kinship talk, you're, um, we're talking about cross cousins here. Um, well, not really cross cousins, but uh, this relationship, which is called the avuncular, sorry, the avuncular, not the cross cousin, the avuncular relationship here, um, sister's brother, or if you like, sorry, sister's son, or mother's brother, the relationship between sister's son and mother's brother. So the mother's brother is confronted by the sister's son, um, the sister's son knows he's going to inherit from his mother's brother, and he demands his inheritance from uh, the mother's brother. The mother's brother now is very unhappy because it makes him feel old and no longer virile or powerful. As a result, there's a belief that mother's brothers often attack their sister's sons with sorcery. So there's an example of how age um, operates in two different societies. Okay, so what's the relevance of all this? What it shows us that is that among all humans, age is itself is constructed differently in different cultures. 
the different ages have different rights and responsibilities. For example, of adults, or for the mesakin um, elder men, they have the responsibility to pass on their wealth to their sister's son. The other thing is issues of identity. How we perceive ourselves and how we perceive others is framed in relation to age. I'm also grateful for my colleague Greg Acciaioli for pointing out these these points to me that uh, really age is one of the crucial sociological parameters or classifications. Along with gender and class, these are one of the main ways that we differentiate between ourselves in different societies. And this is a big concern in late modern or post-industrial societies like the one I'm presenting to you from Australia where there is deep insecurity over pensions and also the lack of power and position of elderly people in our society which has led to movements such as grey power. Okay so this is um, the idea of life uh, life course or s life cycle and as you can see it's closely related to issues of age um, and rights and responsibilities. So one of the limitations of the idea, well I'm sure there are many but I can't think of any at, um, at the moment except for to say that life cycle as a term implies there's some sort of cycle and life course um, implies a natural progression which doesn't actually apply to some societies. For example amongst the Aboriginals of the Western Desert in Australia, amongst the Sambia of New Guinea, you have to be made into a man. You don't naturally become a man. In fact, if it wasn't for the forceful and violent intervention of the elder men, you would probably just wither away, a uh, young boy would probably wither away into a weak, as they see it, female. But thanks to the intervention of the elders, these people could be made into men. So if we use the idea of life cycle or life course in a society like the Sambians or like this or the Western Desert Aboriginals in Australia, it will be problematic if we don't bear in mind that it's not seen as a, a natural progression. The aging is not seen as a natural progression in those societies. Okay, for the references, I spoke to my uh, colleague, Dr. Greg Accioli also used um, Nadal's um, essay on witchcraft in four societies to talk about the Mesakin and Koronko. The stuff on the Ngung is taken from Shostak's wonderful book Nisa, which is actually a great introduction to anthropology. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you soon. Come in! Hello.